talk is Four Pillars of Visualization. Um, the origins of this talk I, I find really entertaining. I was asked to give a talk at one point called Every Visualization You've Seen is Wrong. And I was like, well, that's cool. Uh, but before I could do that, I had to, I can skip the bio. Um, before that, I had to talk about what do broken visualizations look like? What are they missing? So I had to come up with criteria for success. And what I came up with uh, and have evolved a little bit since then um, is uh, uh, a structure for evaluating, but also a, a process for designing visualizations so that they are most effective and actually get across the information you want to communicate. So uh, the four pillars are um, your visualization must have a clear purpose. You must have the relevant content and only the relevant content. You have to have appropriate structure. And by structure in this context, I'm talking about uh, is this a line graph? Is this a bar graph? Is this a flow chart? Is this a map? What, you know, what kind of uh, layout on the page are we using? Uh, and finally, useful formatting. And formatting in this situation um, is, a, is an umbrella. Uh, there's too much under that umbrella to address today. It's about a quarter of grad school's worth of material, so we're going to give it about four minutes today. Uh, and I'll give you some, some links to some resources where you can go a little bit deeper into that. So um, a, a touch more about each. So purpose. Why are we creating this visualization, or, or why are we reading this visualization? What's it for? Do we know what its, what its goals are? Do we know, you know what it's focused on and what we hope to get out of it? Uh, the content is the what. what, what needs to be included in it. Structure, as I, as I was just saying, is the how. Um, formatting is labels, is fonts, is uh, typically applying some colors afterwards. It's um, uh, tick marks on the axes. It's all the other visual effect of everything that you're layering onto the visualization. So I um, apologize, that's not quite as bright as I would like. There's a really nicely layered cake in here. So there's three solid layers, and you've got to have a good purpose and content and structure to have a real cake, unless it's a two-layer cake, but that's not today. Um, the formatting is useful. It's interesting. It makes the cake more flavorful and probably more interesting to look at. But if the cake itself is bad, it doesn't matter how much nice frosting you put on it, it's still not going to be a good cake. On the other hand, if you've got a pretty good basic cake and kind of got boring frosting, you can still enjoy the cake even if it's not fully decorated. So uh, formatting is an equal player, but it's not worth spending time and attention on fancy formatting if you haven't got a good cake underneath it. So as a designer, and this also, this also applies as a consumer, but I'm assuming most of you are coming at this from the end where you're creating content. Um, if you're creating this content, you have to understand why am I creating this visualization? The, the answer that a lot of people come up with um, is sort of equivalent of, what does your business do? And you say, well, we make money. It's like, what's this visualization for? Well, it's to show the data. It's like, well, that's, that's good. We like that, but can you be more specific? Is there some relationship you're looking for? Is there some piece of the data you're looking at? Is there something you want to learn from the data? Like, we all just kind of want to go in and play with the data, and that's fine. But, but uh, often, there's a situation where we need to learn a certain thing. And um, you need to be able to articulate what it is you're trying to get from the visualization to design it most effectively, because you can't have it meet those goals if you don't know what those goals are. So you have to answer questions for yourself, like, who is this for, right? Something you design for a technician is going to be really different than something you design for an executive. Something you design for an investor is going to be really different than something you design for a customer, right? Thinking about these things, um, uh, who is it going to be for? How are they going to consume it? What do they need to understand? Uh, what decisions or actions are you trying to enable? This is very much like the what are we trying to learn from it? Um, how is it going to be consumed, right? Is this a tiny little, uh, you know, um, three-inch screen that is going to be consumed on, or is this a 30-inch display, right? Is this going to go black and white into a print document that's going to be bound into the annual report, or is this going to be interactive with filters and I can pick my data channels? These are, these are radical differences in, in, uh, in the content and the, and the use case, and you need to design different visualizations to satisfy these if you want to be successful. So all this we're still talking about up here. We're still talking about the purpose, right? Thinking about who's going to use it, how are they going to consume it, um, having a, not necessarily uh, set in stone, but a pretty good idea of at least how you're starting out uh, is going to really make your, your project more successful. These are going to evolve. You're going to iterate this as you learn from the data, as you get feedback from your user, from your customer, from whoever it is needs to, to learn from this. But um, you should start out with a pretty decent idea of how it's going to be used and who's going uh, to use it, what they're trying to learn from it. Um, so I live in Seattle. And you could do this map pretty much the same from San Francisco. If the purpose I have is drive to the East Coast, I can probably do that. It's not very specific, and it doesn't guarantee any particular quality of outcome. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm trying to get to New York, 
and I have a map that almost looks the same, but it takes me to Baltimore, I'm not going to be very happy with that outcome, right? You need to have different documents. You need to have different data supply to get you to different places. And so really understanding what the destination is that you're trying to lead people to um, is, is absolutely going to affect what the document is that you give them, what this deliverable is, what information it contains, where it guides them. How do you know what your purpose is? How do you know what common purposes are? Um, this is a screenshot from IBM's Many Eyes website. It's an online graphing tool. And uh, you'll notice that it's got these headings, right? And there's different graph types under these different headings. It turns out that these headings, these are very common, very archetypal, very powerful business purposes. Compare values. These are different graphs than track changes over time. These are different graphs than see the relationships among data points. Those are grouped there for a reason. Those are, those are archetypal, very common business purposes. Not every analysis, not every use case is going to have exactly one of these purposes. Um, oftentimes we mix and match, we combine, or we, we sort of layer these purposes one within another. But uh, if you're kind of not sure, you're looking at your data and you're like, well, I need to see the data, but I'm kind of not sure what I'm doing, you can come back to, if you want to, come to Many Eyes or one of these other sources and say, do I care more about change over time or the relationship among the data points? Or maybe we need to hybridize them. Do I care more about the fractions of a whole or am I just comparing the set elements and I kind of don't care what the, what the whole is, right? Um, these are, this is a really nice sort of quick reference, a quick reminder for yourself of what are the different sorts of purposes? How does my need, how does the questions I need to answer map onto these different purpose types that are available to me? Once you know what your purpose is, you can then pick content. Most of the time, the answer for which content do you need, most of the time, the answer is not all of it. Um, most of the time, all of the content is the wrong answer. It's cool to have, and, and I don't know about you, but I spent like 16 or more years of my education being told, show your work, and now you come to conferences like this, and it's all about big data, and, and how many gigabytes per second, and, and, and how many exabytes of storage do you have, and how big is your Hadoop cluster, and how many, no and, and we forget that most people don't want to see all that all the time. Most people just want the answer, right? And this is a problem. We have this with search engines, right? I know what my question is. I, just want to, I don't want 26 million results. I just want my answer. I don't want to have to sift through. Um, so it's, it's very powerful to limit the response to what's relevant. So the question is what data matters, not what data do I have. Don't fetishize all the data in the world. Just give the right answer. So what data actually matters? What are the relationships that matter? This is the key. Right? This is what you're really looking for. Um, once you've answered these, you can pick the data that, that you really need to include. And you maybe layer on the other stuff later, or you do a second visualization that has some of the related data. But for the one that we're designing today, understand what matters. This will be completely informed by the purpose. The purpose is going to tell you what questions we're trying to answer, what data does it take to inform that. Uh, and so finally, the bottom line here, what's excluded is as important as what's included. So here's a nice example. This is a uh, uh, census population map um, color-coded by race. This was inspired by another one that a buddy of mine did where he mapped uh, every person in North America based on the census map. And it was just, that was it. You could just zoom in and it was pretty cool. So another project took that data and did the uh, race encoding and it's great. Um, it's kind of interesting, but it's really hard to learn much here except the blue dots are white people and then the other colors are other people. So okay, so there's more people over on this side of the country than on that side, but we can't learn very much. And, and sometimes when confronted with a lot of data, we say, well, we're gonna annotate it. We'll add some labels. And, and sometimes that's useful, but there's not really a lot of new information here that I probably couldn't have figured out if I knew a little bit about, about the geography here. So let's take a zoomed in look a little bit. This is a neighborhood in Brooklyn. And this is fascinating, right? Because now you can see uh, you can see the racial divides along certain blocks. You can see that you know, particular streets have different groups of different races. I'm sorry, the colors aren't a little better here. There's really interesting like pockets of orange here next to the red. Like, there's interesting things going on here. And now we are zoomed at a level where instead of 350 million people, right, we're probably looking at um, fewer than 100,000. Right? And now we have enough context, it's localized enough, and we have enough contrast, and we can see uh, changes within individual blocks within individual neighborhoods. Now we can have a real conversation about what's interesting about the data, where when we were given 350 million data points, there was too much to have a conversation about any relevant piece of it. So in this case, the right amount of content was less, several orders of magnitude less, but now there's enough that we can actually 
wrap our minds around. We can actually have a conversation and we can learn something useful from what we're seeing here on this, this smaller subset rather than the whole world. Um, I should have gone back. I'll preface this. This is a boring graph. There's two data points, right? How much more boring can you get than two data points? Um, until the graph is explained. So what this is, is uh, Q4 2011 revenues. So the iPhone, uh, not quite 25 billion, and Microsoft, not quite 21 billion. That's amazing. That is an incredibly impactful graph, right? And you could do all kinds of things. You could show market share of the different product lines within the companies as they changed over time and how the iPhone grew and uh, blah, 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 market cap, stock valuation, the dead years of Balmer. You could do all that, right? But what this is is two data points, and it's a stunning demonstration of what was going on in the industry. This is a product that four and a half years earlier did not exist, and that single product line now is bigger than all of Microsoft. That's incredible. And it's more impressive with two data points than if we had done the market cap and the history and the stock evaluation and the product launch. Forget all that. This is incredible. And if you know anything about the industry, if you know anything about these two companies and the history of these companies, that's a mind-blowing fact right there. It's gotten worse since then. But um, this graph like, really makes people sit up and listen. Uh, so two data points. You can have incredible impact. And the reason that this has such impact is it's focused, right? There's one very clear, simple message here. Uh, and it gets it across much more effectively than if this was one message among 19 different messages that you could take away from 19 different graphs and all the other data that was there. Structure. How do you best reveal the important data and relationships? This is a really interesting question. Um, I'm actually going to uh, do some more, do and, and, and write and publish some more um, blog posts and white papers about this. This is a, this is a conversation that uh, for me started uh, as an undergraduate and I was a physics major and you're learning like how do you, which graph types do you use? Well, it depends on what data you're trying to show, what you're trying to communicate with it. Um, so the interesting thing is given even a small set of data, you can pick different structures and you can reveal, you can emphasize different aspects of that data depending on the structure that you pick. And it's going, to re it's going to focus on different relationships, different interactions among those different data types. You want to choose meaningful axes. That's a lot harder than it sounds sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes the defaults are not what we want to go to because the defaults are really useful. I really do like defaults. There's reasons we have them, but sometimes they're wrong. Uh, and you have, to, you have to understand when the cost of stepping away from a default is worth it in the payoff of knowledge that you get afterwards from it. Um, use two axes, not three. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a second. And finally, this is informed by purpose and content. And I say that because uh, it, as the content changes, as the purpose changes, we really do need to pick a different structure. We can't always just go back to the same default structures. Nor can you just arbitrarily pick a structure and shoehorn your content into it and hope that it's going to come out well. That's done a lot on the internet these days, and it's a little bit painful. Um, it's fun to poke fun at, though. There'll be an example of that later. So here's why not to use 3D. Uh, and again, I apologize for the color, but honestly, it wouldn't have made any difference here. Um, so 3D is bad for a couple of reasons. One is it simply distorts the data. Uh, it, you, get, you get all kinds of weird perspective issues that as human beings we're not very well equipped to deal with. It's really hard to tell where these intersect with the backing lines, right? Is this below zero? Well, not really. It's coming up from the floor, but I can't tell how much. Um, sometimes these graphs are designed where, the, where the, the background gallery is meant to sort of intersect through the middle of the data point, but you can't tell. You get no precision here. It, it actually obscures the data. It makes it harder to understand. Uh, the other issue, and this is not the best example of it, but um, when you're really trying to do 3D, the, the data that's in, in the back gets obscured by the data that's in the front, and that's really hard to do. Uh, hard to do well and hard to not have, have the data be obscured. So. Um, the bottom line is, unless you are uh, working in a very specialized data set with an audience who really understands what you're doing, stay away from 3D. It's hard to use it decoratively. Well, it's impossible to use it usefully decoratively, I think. Um, and it's very, very difficult to implement when you're actually trying to do data in three dimensions that way. There's more effective ways to, to show different data dimensions like that. Um, one of which is show them in different graphs. So this is, this is really just a very simple bar graph and they're trying to spice it up by giving it the 3D, but what they've made is they've made it much more, much more difficult to use. Like there's no real way to get uh, any sort of a useful estimation of, of comparing these sizes or seeing even where they, 
where they fall against the grid. So, so just don't. Just um, go for you know, a clean, modern, flat look. Uh, all the cool kids are doing it these days. And you'll get much more legible data that people can understand more easily. So here's a structure fail. Ooh. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. They're all sort of muddy greens. Can you see that there's a, a fourth, four, four, four sort of wedges around here? Again, I apologize for the, the color being a little washed out. It doesn't matter because you wouldn't be able to tell what the data was anyway. So this is a, uh, it's a graph. It's comparing the Pew results for Romney and Obama with the Gallup results for Romney and Obama. And that's useful, right? You want to compare. What is this poll showing? What's the other poll showing? It's a, it's a, valid, um, it's a valid proposition. They have useful data, right? They've got the numbers here. Here's the, the Obama and Romney numbers for, for the two different polls. But uh, it turns out we're really bad at comparing the circular arc length. And we're a little bit better at comparing angle like this, but this is a donut, not a pie, so they took out that useful angle part from the middle. So what we have is these arc lengths, and you know, the, the difference here is, is like not even 10%, you know, the biggest gap from 45 to 49%. We can't see the difference there. Even if the lighting was good, even if this wasn't distorted by being projected, you wouldn't really be able to say that wedge is, is four percentage points bigger than the other one. We're just not good. We don't get arc length for free in our brains. Our brains are really good at some things. It turns out we're really good at length. We're, we're, we're just about better at length than anything else. So length of things against a common baseline, we can perceive amazingly well. If you ever doubt this, hang a row of photos in your hallway or do a layout on a page of a bunch of photos without turning on the guides and somebody will walk by and be like, oh, that one's too low. Like they'll just glance, right? And they'll see because it won't be lined up. We're really good at this. You can see this 1% difference here. It takes no time at all for me to say, which one of those is the shortest bar? You can't not see it. Our brains are wired for this stuff, some of them, right? So uh, the perception systems in our eyes and in our brains give us length for free. That is built into the hardware, for real. We don't get circular arc length. We can kind of process on it and try to compare and try to move them around in our head and see uh, if this arc length looks bigger than that arc length. We don't get it for free. We absolutely get length for free. So if what you want to do is compare magnitude, length is absolutely the way to go. So, no change in the purpose, no change in the content, but this is an example of picking a structure that actually reveals what it is we were trying to show uh, in a way that is meaningful. Do you guys use Hitmonk? Anybody who travels should be using Hitmonk. It's the best thing. It's a, it's a flight search engine. Um, I was really, well, I'll, I'll tell the second half of the story in a minute. Um, here's my flight results. And if you're coming from um, I used to use Kayak, Kayak is great, or anybody else for the most part. You get a list sorted by either number of stopovers or departure time or length of flight or preferred airline or price. Or I don't, I, they don't use any of those to sort vertically, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but they have a lot of information encoded horizontally. And just like I was saying before, we're really good at things like length and, and, and vertical and horizontal placement. If I say to you, which is the earliest flight of the day? How long does it take you to find the earliest flight? I'm sorry? Too long to find the earliest flight? No, here, seriously. What's the early, on this page, what's the earliest flight? It, right, it's right there. You can't miss it. You can't not see it. It is actually wired into your brain. You can't not see it. This is the latest flight. If I say, which is the longest one? Maybe you can't tell exactly because we're not sorting against a common baseline, but you can pretty quickly tell that these flights are longer than the other ones. If I ask which, which flights have a stopover in them, if I ask um, uh, you know, which are sort of the first part of the day, the last part of the day, we get that stuff really quickly. Everything, uh, question, yeah. Different dates? Yes. But if you want to show more information on this, like uh, different days, sure. Far and different days to arrive. Um, they, the way they do it is they just extend this. So if you have, if I'm going to fly either Thursday night or Friday morning, and I'm not sure which, they just extend this graph to show both. So all these things that I've talked about: earliest flight, latest flight, duration, stopover. All of this stuff is encoded with horizontal position. It's a ton of information that they're giving you just with horizontal position. And they've, they've used this horizontal position so usefully 
that they have freed up that vertical axis to give you some other value. And so instead of, by sorting, uh, instead of sorting these by departure time or by price or anything else, which you can do, their default sort is called agony. <laughs> and agony is a synthetic metric that they've calculated based on price and duration and departure time. And if you need to sort by departure time, you can do that too. You can also just drag these bars like a curtain and as soon as it touches a flight, that flight disappears. You know, I can't land too late, I'll miss the wedding or I don't want to get up early. So, um, They've used that horizontal position so effectively that they can give you added value by using that vertical position to encode something else really interesting and useful. So, Spatial position, length, size um, is, is uh, not quite always, but is, is very often the most, the most visible and therefore the most useful of the visual encoding properties. When I say visual encoding properties, I'm talking about position, size, shape, color, uh, boldness, texture, all these things. Position is particularly powerful. And that's why it gets pulled out as, as we call it structure in this case. Uh, because that physical relationship, that placement in space is so powerful and so effective, you have to consider that first before you consider other things because you want that to reveal your most important data or your most important relationships. How do you know what structures to use? We're going to go back to this page on many eyes. The structures that you use, these, everything that's grouped under one of these headings is unique under this heading. It's not going to appear under the other headings. The reason is, it goes back to that, the, the science of vision and perception that I was talking about. There are certain things that we're really good at, at uh, understanding or comparing uh, in, in certain different ways. So these structures here, pardon me, are grouped under these purposes because a structure like a line graph is really useful for showing changes over time. That's how our brain naturally interprets it. Some of it is learned, but some of it is not. Some of it doesn't matter what culture you grew up in. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Footnote that. Um, bar charts can be better for comparing values than something like a tree map. That's much more effective for comparing parts of a whole. These structures are sorted under, uh, under these headings for a reason. So if you know what your purpose is, you can, to some degree, deterministically say, these are the sorts of structures that are going to be most effective at revealing that kind of relationship. Um, there are some learned things. A lot of these are not learned. A lot of these are built into our brains. There's a few learned things. So if you grew up uh, speaking English or French or German or Spanish or one of these Latin languages that goes left to right and you take a classroom full of kindergartners and you say, draw the timeline of your day. And they'll say, oh, I got up and ate breakfast and blah, blah, blah. And they'll do that left to right. And if you take a classroom of kids who grew up speaking Hebrew and Arabic that are written from right to left and you say, draw me the timeline of your day. They say, oh, I got up and they do it right to left. So that's a learned thing. That's in a culture thing. Um, but, but things like perception of size relating to magnitude, uh, that kind of thing, built into the brain, not learned. So uh, understanding that is, is, is super, super valuable. Finally, formatting. Um, how does it look and feel? How will it be consumed? This is, like I said, this is a, this is a too big, uh, I'm sweeping a lot under this rug of formatting, and we're going to touch on just a little bit of it. Once you've put your data points in space, because you define the space or the structure, you may want to make them a certain size, you may want to make them a color, you may want to apply labeling, texture, uh, shape, any number of these other encodings. And how do you know how to do that well? How do you know which of these multitude of encodings? Do I want to make this a size or a color or a shape difference? I'm not sure. One, you have to know what it is you want to emphasize, which data channels you've got that you want to highlight or reveal or, or emphasize, um, and you need to know how it's going to be consumed. And then you can go ahead, pick the most important data, and encode it in the right sorts of ways. So here's a really nice piece done by the New York Times. This is of um, uh, homicide rates in different neighborhoods in Chicago. And so they've got a couple of different encodings going on here. The map is the map you'd expect. Uh, these are, I don't know how they exactly define these neighborhoods, but the little white lines are just neighborhood boundaries, and that's probably just conventional neighborhoods or the city's districting or something. Number of homicides is uh, the orange bullets here. Uh, sorry, bad choice of words. The orange dots, I apologize. Um, and you can see some neighborhoods have a lot of them and some have very few. The background shading is the uh, racial majority in whatever those districts are. And then they've done this thing where they've highlighted with these, these boxes and called out some very specific neighborhoods here, right? 
So they're using, uh, in addition to this, this map structure with the labels and, and the lines that define the map, they've got different encodings that they're using going on for uh, the racial category, the quantity here, uh, and then highlight, right? So they're doing a lot of interesting things and they've done it very well so that they are calling attention to what matters, they're revealing the contrast in the data that's useful, um, and of course there's narrative behind it. Uh, a side note, people often ask, who, who's doing visualization very well? Who's, who does this stuff most effectively? And it tends to be places like the New York Times, The Guardian, uh, sometimes The Economist does really nice stuff, The Washington Post often does really nice stuff. Um, these are all journalist organizations. Why, why is it that they're doing this data work well? And the answer is they're not data organizations, they're storytelling organizations. And they come to the creation of these with a story in mind. It's their job, their purpose, is to take some sort of knowledge and convey it in a useful manner to their customers, right? That's how they stay in business. So they're very good at understanding which content matters and thinking about how are we gonna convey this effectively to our audience. And so even though they are Storytelling organizations, not data organizations, what they do with data is very effective and very nicely done. They've also got really smart people working for them. So these encodings, um, jumping back to it. So how do you pick formatting? So this is a table. Uh, you can download this. The, this is from my blog, complexdiagrams.com slash properties. The link's on here twice. Um, I'm not the first person to draw this table. Uh, there's many versions of this sort of table out there in the world. This is, this is my version. Uh, it takes the various visual encoding properties. This is not all of them, but this is sort of the most common ones. And I've left off ones that are either hard to use or uh, just, just people don't use as much, like jitter and blur and skew and some of these other things. In the middle, there's a little bit of a conversation that defines these properties and how we perceive them, how our brains perceive them. And then this right-hand third is, what are they good for? And so the way this works is you say, I have some categorical data. Give me a good encoding. Uh, well, text is up here. Text doesn't really count as a visual encoding. Position is up here, and you'll notice position is good for everything. Like I said before, it's often the easiest to perceive and the most powerful visual encoding. And uh, other than those two, when we come down looking at categories, we can say, oh, shape is good for this, texture is good for this, color is good for this, um, uh, and enclosure, right? So this is how we use the table. And then we pick whichever of these we haven't used that we would like to apply. Uh, to this visual property as we're adding properties to the data. If we want to instead say I have data to relate, that's a different set. If we say uh, I have data that's quantified or maybe it's not quite quantified but it's ranked, there's some other properties in here that we can use. There's one surprising result on this chart that throws everybody and that's color. And so I'm going to spend just a minute talking about this. So the two defining um, perceptive qualities of all these different visual encodings is does our brain perceive these as being naturally ordered? Do we perceive size as ordered? Yes, this one's bigger, that one's smaller. You can't not see it. And then how many useful values are there? How, 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 how small can we discern? So you can look at the face of a clock and be like, well, angle, like, I can see a five minute difference. So we can get at least 12 different angles out of 360. But can I tell the difference between 17 minutes after and 19 minutes after on the face of a clock? Probably not. That's getting a little more subtle than my brain at least is capable of. So there's a medium number of useful angles. So an angle, I've got medium to few here. Um, on the other hand, uh, given size or position, I can pretty much always tell you which one's left and right most. And, and unless they're very far apart, I can probably tell you which one is left or right of the other. So I'm pretty good at position. And the same thing with size. If there's a whole bunch of dots on the page, even if one's only a little bigger than the other, unless they're very far apart, I'm usually pretty good at seeing which one's bigger and smaller. So we've got a lot more options in things like size and length than we do with things like angle. So let's come back to color. There's not that many colors we can perceive a huge number of different colors. There's not that many colors that are uh, colorblind safe and far enough in color space that we can easily perceive the differences and different enough in color that we can talk about them. Does anybody here ever use a, a, a graphing tool called Excel? <laughs> How many different shades of blue are in the Excel palette, right? There's like the bright teal blue and then maybe there's a light blue and then pretty soon you're talking about robin's egg blue and sky blue and light blue, it, like it's crazy. So, having colors where there's a range that you can definitively say, I'm gonna use a word and we're all in the same room gonna know what that color is, 
Um, it turns out that the, the useful set of colors is fewer than 20 uh, in terms of really being able to strongly differentiate them. The other thing that's a, an even bigger gotcha here with color, color is not naturally ordered in the brain. So we have social conventions about the rainbow. You can go out and measure wavelength, but our brain doesn't say purple comes before yellow or orange is bigger than blue. You can't have that. We can have conversations about that. We can learn that, but it's not a dependable thing, right? Um, this is tricky because people all the time, you'll see this all the time, use a rainbow color scale for magnitude or for quantity or for whatever. And uh, that's, that's challenging because it doesn't necessarily have a meaning that you believe. Sometimes there's a, a strong convention and it's a little bit of a limited use and you use like a red-green scale or a blue-orange scale. And if you're using two colors, that's fine. But as you cycle through the rainbow, people are constantly having to go back to the, I, I should have put an example in here, constantly having to go back to the, uh, to the legend to try to understand what they're looking at. It's the wrong way to do it. Don't use color for quantity. You can shade things of intensity, so you can do darker and lighter, and you can get relative intensity, although not quantity out of that. You can't say that's 2.4 times as bright, but you can definitely say this one's brighter than that. Although that tops out if you're looking at the little shading thing on the newspaper, mm, seven to nine values maybe. You're not gonna be able to subtly differentiate 14 different shades of brown, right? Uh, even in terms of intensity. So, um, so color is really excellent for categories really excellent for sorting things into flavors or regions or sports teams or product lines when you've got seven of them or you've got five of them. Um, but it's really bad to say we have 14 different colors cycling through the rainbow that indicate different altitudes or magnitudes. And so you see a well done altitude map will have shades of brown, very pale at the beach and darker and darker as you go up the mountain. And then the shallow water at the beach is very, very pale blue and it gets darker and darker as you go down to the ocean. And that's, that's uh, an intensity gradient of brightness or saturation rather than cycling through the rainbow. So, um, like I said, you can download a copy of this uh, at my blog, complexdiagrams.com slash properties. There's also a white paper up there that goes much more into depth in the using of this and describing these. Um, which I'll talk about more in just a moment. So here's the checklist for designers. Is the purpose well defined? Do you know what it is you're doing here? If you can't sort of answer yes to that, you should probably think more about what you want to do and why you're here. The second bullet point, does the content support the purpose? Do we have too much content? Do we have the wrong content or do we have just enough? Uh, this whole first half is the part that people skip. And they have some data and they go right into, let's pick a cool structure, let's, let's do a cool graph of this. You really only can go into the structure and play with the graph. And this is again for presentation. If you're exploring, do whatever you want. And you, and you should iterate and you should try different things. But when you get to the point where you're presenting, where you're teaching this to other people, uh, you have to understand your purpose and get the right content before you can start to talk about your structure. Then you allow the purpose and the content that you have and the relationships that you have that you need to reveal to dictate what structure you pick. And you pick the right structure that reveals that most importantly. And finally, uh, you layer on these other sorts of, of formatting with the labels, with the size, with the shape, et cetera, um, to sort of flush out and fill out the message that, of, of what you're designing. Uh, and as always, iterate, iterate, iterate. Like I do this full time, more or less professionally, and I get the right structure right about 60% of the time, the first time, right? And a lot of the time you say, we're gonna do it like this, and then you put some real data and you're like, oh, th there's nothing interesting to see in this view because all the data is clustered to the bottom, except there's one huge outlier that compresses everything else. We need a different graph or whatever it is. So you have to iterate, play with this, try some different things. Um, this is the white paper that I said that is, it's, it's linked from that same, that same blog post with the formatting table, or you can just download it directly bit.ly slash successful viz. You will have to register with IBM. I apologize for that, but it's a free white paper otherwise. Um, and then IBM has all sorts of other uh, resources, including Alan, who'll be up speaking next. Um, uh, data viz resources, including some stuff online, and I'm on Twitter, and there's a Many Eyes account on Twitter, and there's some of our talks up on YouTube and whatnot. And I think that's the end of the deck. And I'm just a few minutes early, so we can do Q&A. Yes? Yes. And the reason is to not have many different charts showing many different things. 
Yes. So there's so much information on one chart. Yeah. Is that not a better thing? Um, so to rephrase the question just for the recording, there are some tools that allow you to put a lot of information onto one chart. Uh, and how do you choose to do between that or do many different charts? Is that a reasonable restatement? Okay. So um, it goes back to purpose. And sometimes, sometimes that that's fine, right? If you've seen, um, I, I did this whole pared down version of the deck because I'm used to having longer to talk, so I took out a bunch of stuff, but I wish I had all my examples in here that I usually have. If you've ever seen Hans Rosling, uh, give a great TED talk, a, a number of great TED talks. Um, so, so for example, with the scatter plot, you can do a lot. You can have two axes, you can do size, you can do color, you can do shape encoding if you want to. Um, if you want to leave a trace over time, all of a sudden you're looking at like six different data channels on, on one graph. And that can be a really excellent way to wrap your head around a lot of data. If it's well defined and focused and it's not just we're throwing up all the data there because we can. Uh, it depends on what message you want to communicate. It depends on what the, what the, um, you know, the takeaway is, what's important to this audience, how much do, do they want the, you know, the deep dive into all the subtleties of the data, or do they want one answer per page, right? If it's one answer per page, you want to break it out and you want to give one very simple graph each. Uh, if somebody wants to see things in context and wants to compare uh, a, a variety of layers, then you can layer it all and, and, and show it. Um, multiple layers in one graph, although I would, I, would, uh, I would say my caution would be be very intentional about doing that. Don't put more in than people really are going to need. Don't put more in than is going to actually answer specific questions. Um, it can be done well. It's the, you know, the more data you add, the more challenging it is to do it with clarity. So uh, you, you run the risk of, of, of just swamping the whole thing, right? Um, yeah. Slides is an energy used for penalization purposes and slides or visualization which are used for broadcast. Pro, pro mm -hmm. um, slides which are used for conversation, uh, you can have one or two questions answered in the slide. It's very easy, you know, and the slides are you know, only serving that one question. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you have minimal number of dimensions. But when you have I'm sorry, minimal number of? Minimal number of dimensions. Images. In, images. Yeah. Images, too, right? You know, uh, but when you're trying to broadcast, you know, uh, like, you know, you want to just, you know, get as much as possible on one given slide or maybe that's the intent, you know, when, when we do that, you know, like, hey, I want to have, like, a marketing slide for the whole art on a weekly basis or maybe on a daily basis, right? Yeah. The first thing the VP comes and looks at is, you know, what are my fees going for? Right, right. And the same chart is now visualized by the director, hey, what are my fee KPIs for? Right. So that's where it intends, that, that's where, it, you know, uh, to, you know, so many things on slide. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you're describing a situation where you have multiple competing purposes and a very limited resource to communicate. Yeah, I would say real estate. Yeah, limited real estate, whatever it is, whether it's number of pages or, or, or space on the page. Um, one way to address that is you can take your page and split it into four and have four like very clear single snapshots, right? Uh, rather than sort of layering everything one on top of the other where they're all obscuring the other, you can still break them out. And if it's simple enough, like that, that Apple and Microsoft graph, two data points, you could make that this big and it would still be effective. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting constraint that's going to absolutely inform your design process. Yeah. I have another question. You uh, yeah. mentioned about colors. You know, we tend to use this, you know, uh, the, the traffic light colors, red, you know, yeah. the, the green and yellow, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you even recommend using those colors for using line charts? So, uh, is that even impactful? right, so that's a great question, using, using traffic colors to indicate status. Uh, we have strong cultural conversations around that, mm -hmm. so that's okay. Um, the drawbacks are 7% uh, of the population is going to be colorblind and is not going to be able to differentiate that red and green, mm -hmm. and so that's difficult. Um, a lot of places where it's just two axes or two, two values, good, bad, um, or just simply two values instead of using red and green are moving to blue and orange because those tend to be colorblind safe. Uh, you can, if you want to, layer meaning of blue is good and orange is bad, but you don't have to. You can just say blue region is west and orange region is east or something. Um, uh, I've also seen uh, and, and recommended a number of times on dashboards, instead of just having the dot that says this is the red dot or the green dot, you have the circle is good and the triangle is bad. 
So even if there's colorblind issues, you can see with the shape. And you can do both. You can have color and shape. So that's called redundant encoding, where you're putting the same information into different visual channels. And so it comes into your brain sort of in stereo in that way. Um, and so then if it gets, the colors get washed out, or there's someone who's colorblind, or it gets mimeographed, or something like that, you know, uh, you, you can still retain the sense of it. Um, so I like, uh, yeah, I like that. I like moving away from red and green and moving towards uh, shape. Um, one other issue with color that I didn't get into, but uh, with, with single colors and, and with, with, with pairs and, 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 and groups of colors, you can stumble across a lot of cultural meaning accidentally, right? Um, the favorite story that I heard about this is they, they got the, young, the, the, the youngest developer, the brand new intern developer, like, well, code us up a dashboard that shows us the status of all the systems and writes this up and brings up the dashboard and it's all red. And the question, everyone's like, did everything just crash and we didn't notice? Did the developer forget to wire it up? What's going on? And the kid says, red means good luck. It's all good. What's the problem here, right? Lots of, lot, subject to lots of interpretation. Um, if you go into the Irish neighborhood on St. Patrick's Day and you're wearing orange, that's really different than if you're going and wearing green. If you're in the Middle East, blue and white is very different than green and white. So there's all these cultural associations with color that uh, can be useful and can be constructive, like red, yellow, green. Um, but might trip you up eventually. There might be, there might be errors in interpretation in some of these. So um, color is difficult. Color is tricky. The, uh, um, I had a phrase on here that said, uh, position is everything on the structure graph. Uh, position is everything, color is difficult were six words that another uh, visualization guy named Ritz Steffener had on one slide. Position is everything, color is difficult. And he said, this is the two most important things in visualization, or the two hardest problems in visualization. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a, the color is tricky to do, to do well. And I don't have a, a shorter answer than that. Yeah. So, uh, one chart that is, it's about labeling, right? Like catch labels on data points. Yeah. How many times they get like extra up? Yeah. How do you solve that? Uh, how do you solve the labeling real estate problem? That's also a great question. Um, you, uh, one way to do it is you only label the outliers, because those are the interesting ones. Like if, if everything is all clumped together and there's one up here, you care about that one and not about these ones. Um, one is you, if you are allowed to do it interactively, you mouse over a point and it highlights the point and the label jumps out. Because um, people are either going to be looking, for, people are going to look for two things, right? They're going to look for what the violations are, the outliers, the leaders, whatever, right? Or they're going to say, where am I? So you either make it possible for them to find themselves and then, and then there they are, or you can click on the thing on the side and it highlights which one they're looking for. Or you label the ones that are further apart, that are at the edges, because those are the ones that people care about the most. The stuff that's all clumped in the middle, probably we know it's all clumped already, and what we care about is the stuff that's, that's the outliers. Sure, yeah. And maybe those are color coded, and I can say, oh, the blue one's on the left and the green one's on the right in this clump or something. And then if you, if you, you know what those colors mean, or you can zoom in, or you can mouse over, or you can get some data. But I, I, I mean, it's, uh, again, this is a tricky technology problem. If you've got zoom, another way to do it is when you zoom out, the labels disappear, and the, and the closer you zoom in, the more detail you get. Um, but it, it depends on whether it's interactive, it depends on whether it's in print, depends on whether you care about a specific data point or you care about the interesting data points. There's lots of ways to interpret it. Any more questions? Well, why don't we uh, wrap it up and um, I guess have a short break and the next talk will be from Alan. Thank you very much.